Good afternoon, everybody. And as I always like to do, good morning to those who are joining from the US. We have some very dedicated colleagues who are on the line. So welcome, everybody. I hope you're well, wherever you are. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm a research fellow in politics at St. Edmunds College at the University of Cambridge. And it's, as always, my great pleasure to introduce this next event in our Cambridge series on the future of the island of Ireland. This with Lucinda Creighton in conversation with Dr. Judy Smith, Baroness Smith of Unum on the subject of Ireland in the EU post Brexit. We're delighted to be continuing this series over the coming months and I'll provide details as always at the end of the session of some upcoming events that we have. As before, we want to finish within an hour. So I'm gonna introduce Lucinda momentarily and she'll speak for up to 10 minutes. This will be followed by a 20 minute discussion with Dr. Smith. Then this should allow about 25 minutes for questions and answers. As always, the chat function is enabled. So please do use it to submit questions. I'll be looking at it for about the next 30 minutes. Um, when you're putting in a question, please, please try to be concise um, and do also mention any affiliations you have, if you have one, and if you feel that they're relevant. So without further ado, Lucinda Creighton is CEO of Vulcan Consulting, uh, a barrister and former, former Irish Minister for European Affairs and member of the Dáil, the Irish Parliament from 2007 to 2016. Lucinda was Minister for European Affairs during a very interesting period in recent Irish history, uh, which included um, obviously representing Ireland in key negotiations on Ireland's EU IMF bailout and during Ireland's presidency of the Council of the European Union. Lucinda also led negotiations of 28 member states on the 960 billion euro budget, EU budget, and represented the EU in bilateral trade discussions in the US, leading to the start of the formal TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership negotiations. Her discussant is Dr. Judy Smith, Baroness Smith and Unum, fellow in politics and graduate in politics of the EU with a particular interest in UK's relations with the EU. Her recent work has included European elections and referendums, as well as the role of the European and national parliaments in the European Union. Thank you both for being with us. And Lucinda, you have the floor. Many thanks. Well, thank you so much, um, Barry, and delighted to um, to see everybody uh, virtually uh, this morning. Uh, particular hello to David Liddington, my former former uh, EU Affairs uh, ministerial colleague uh, from back in the day. Lovely to see you again, David, um, and uh, and uh, lovely to see everybody else. Um, so the the title of this discussion, I know we're going to veer off into into lots of different interesting topics, and no doubt Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol, and various um, related issues will arise. But um, the the title is Ireland in the EU post Brexit, and I thought it'd be interesting maybe to kick off with a, that sort of focus about Ireland's place within the European Union, without our nearest neighbour. Um, our often our our foe, but more often than not at EU level, our friend and ally. Um, and our big brother, you know, taking on many of the issues that um, perhaps a small member state like Ireland, um, you know, didn't and doesn't have the capacity to do on its own. So I suppose when I think about Ireland now post-Brexit in the European Union, um, I certainly feel that, you know, Ireland has a, a positive reputation. It's a, 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 lot, a, a lot more positive than it was, uh, for example, after the financial crisis, uh, when Ireland's reputation was certainly damaged um, internationally and, and certainly on the European stage. And I and my colleagues uh, back uh, from uh, the sort of 2010-2011 period onwards, uh, after we entered our bailout programme, etc., spent a lot of time trying to rebuild Ireland's reputation. Uh, I think it's quite different now. Ireland has been the poster child, if you like. That's sometimes used as a derogatory term, but we've been the poster child, the success story of the kind of uh, post-financial crisis recovery period. Um, but when I look at where we stand now, um, as uh, as we move, I suppose, beyond that and beyond Brexit and try to settle into this new uh, uh, world order and European order, I do feel that Ireland is exposed. Um, and I think it's something that we have to reflect on very seriously as a small member state um we you know we have traditionally relied on the uk to advance a lot of our uh key policy priorities um and uh and i suppose to defend our world view and particularly our economic view um so 
I, I, when I say I think we're exposed, that's not to say that I'm unduly worried, but I think we have a lot of work to do now to sort of to equip Ireland within the EU for, for this new existence. Um, if you look at uh, the sort of um, uh, worldview that we, we have shared traditionally with the UK since 1973 when we joined, you know, Ireland is um, the ultimate liberal economy. Um, we are a small open economy with a huge GDP due to massive inward investment from multinational companies, particularly US multinationals. Uh, we are a country that believes fervently in uh, tax competition um, and competitiveness generally. Um, uh, we are not a country that favors uh, undue regulation or state intervention traditionally. That's changing to some extent uh, and in, the, in the aftermath of COVID, obviously, that's going to become a big factor. Um, but we are a country that is um, hugely uh, supportive of um, Europe taking its place amongst um, um, uh, large uh, global economic, uh, economic trading blocks. And we are the country in the EU that benefits most, um, for example, from closer trading relations with the US. And, and that has been proven by, by many studies. And it's why, as, as, um, as Barry said at the outset, when I led Ireland's uh, presidency in 2013, we prioritized TTIP and, um, and worked hard to ensure that we uh, kicked off those negotiations. Sadly, they, they ended um, a, a few years later. Um, so we face huge challenges. Um, we have to maintain our positive uh, rela uh, relations with other EU member states, but equally we want to maintain a very strong relationship bilaterally with the United Kingdom. Um, and we want to maintain a sort of dynamic, um, liberal economic worldview within the EU, but do achieving that without the UK to sort of bat um, to, 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 to lead to that outcome. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to be perceived as a kind of a proxy, either for the UK or for the United States, um, which can be viewed um, quite sceptically by some of our European partners. So many challenges there, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, but perhaps as, a, as an opening um, a salvo, I will leave it there and uh, we can tease out some of these issues through our discussion. Thanks very much, Lucinda. Uh, over to you, Julie. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Lucinda, for opening with a whole set of interesting aspects of Ireland and the European Union. Obviously, from the perspective of London, and maybe even more from the northeast of England and the places where people voted to leave the European Union, there was a sense in which for leavers, membership of the European Union for the UK reduced our sovereignty and made it difficult for us to play a role in the world. How is membership seen from Ireland? Because my sense as an academic working on the European Union is that for Ireland, not only have you benefited financially, but also politically, you've actually been able to evolve as a country away from the United Kingdom since 1973. Absolutely. And I mean, this is, I suppose, where, um, you know, perspectives, of course, they're not they're not uniform, but but generally speaking, perspectives in Ireland are very, very different um, to, to those in the UK in terms of the benefits of EU membership. So when Ireland joined the European U or the European communities was in 1973 with the UK, we were, I think, the poorest country in Europe. Um, we had um, significant economic and, and societal challenges. Um, and I think uh, membership of, U of the European project and the European Union as it has become um, has fairly consistently been perceived as something that has advanced Ireland in many respects, as you've, as, as you've alluded to. You know, um, society has moved on. We have modernized as a, as a country and as a people. Um, but obviously, you know, key to that, and I suppose underpinning all of that, is the economic success that we have enjoyed. So we've gone from being the poorest to not just uh, amongst the wealthiest in the European Union, but, you know, one of the wealthiest nations in the world, um, where our standards of living have um, dramatically improved and uh, where, you know, opportunities for Irish people are unrecognisable as compared to where they were in the 19, early 1970s and, and before that. Um, so, so I think it's perceived really amongst Irish people as 
Um, yes, of course, uh, EU membership involves significant pooling of sovereignty, um, but but we see our sovereignty as almost having been enhanced um, mm -hmm. by our membership of the EU. As a small country, we get to play our part, we get to have a voice at the table. We are small, you know, we, we, we certainly have to fight and we have to be savvy and clever uh, strategically in, in terms of how we approach our membership. And that's an area where I think we really now need to ramp up um, our, our engagement and preparation. Um, we don't really have a strategy as a country, I think, um, post Brexit. So there's work to be done there. Um, but, but overall, um, amongst the Irish population, it is very, very positively perceived. Um, I think just one sort of tangential factor, perhaps, is that much to the chagrin of successive Irish governments, including the one that I was part of, we have had to have a lot of referendums on on mm -hmm. on, on, on Ireland's place in Europe um, because of the Nice Treaty, Lisbon, I think Amsterdam and Maastricht. I think we had referendum on all of them and the Fiscal Compact Treaty, which is the one that I was most involved in. Um, and while it's a, a, I can say candidly, a complete pain in the head for uh, for politicians, you know, having to put this proposition to the people and sort of muster support for the European project, etc., and the individual question of the day. Um, it is, and I, I think it has been, a very important part of the continued engagement of Irish people um, in the, the question of Ireland's place in Europe. And, uh, and that, I think, was really, really clear, particularly in the case of the Fiscal Compact Treaty um, back in 2012. Uh, obviously, we were going through huge economic disruption here at the time. It was an obvious time when Irish people could have turned away from Europe or blamed Europe, and certainly there was logic in 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 terms of some of the behaviour of the ECB at the time. But actually, Irish people said, "No, our future is with Europe," and they voted overwhelmingly. Uh, over sixty percent of the population voted in favour of that treaty, and it was a real seal of approval, I think, for for um, for Ireland's place in Europe. So, for those who were suggesting at the time of the referendum in 2016, that there wouldn't be a problem with the border between the Republic and Northern Ireland because Ireland would simply see that Brexit was going to be so great for the United Kingdom that Ireland would follow us out of the European Union. Were they just dreaming? Or is there any sense in which Ireland could ever leave the European Union? Or did 2016 really mark the final separation between British thinking and Irish thinking? Well, I hope not, in a sense. I mean, it's it's extraordinary that we are so intertwined and interconnected um, as, as countries for, for historical reasons, but also economic reasons. I mean, uh, I think um, Heathrow Dublin is, is, um, is one of the top five busiest air routes mm -hmm. in the world, you know, so, um, there are millions of Irish people living in the, U in the UK and vice versa, a very big um, um, uh, uh, cohort of, of um, UK citizens living here and working and contributing in Ireland. Yet I think Brexit really, really uh, drove home to me how little we actually understand each other. Um, I mean, nobody in Ireland thought it was possible. Now, maybe it was a sort of a, a sense of denial. Nobody here thought it was possible that the UK could vote to leave. I will never forget, I was sitting in Brussels airport when David Cameron announced his intention to hold a referendum. And immediately I turned to my colleague and I said, I can't see how, uh, how that referendum can succeed. In other words, I, I felt it was inevitable that the UK would vote to leave given the, given the opportunity, because how can you have you know, 40 years of negative press about, about the European Union and then expect that the opposite would be the outcome? So, for me, it was kind of um, it, it was kind of clear that this was a huge risk. But amongst the commentaries here, you know, really nobody believed it could happen. A bit like the election of Donald Trump, I would say. Mm -hmm. Nobody anticipated that it yep. would happen, and everybody was taken by surprise. And I think that demonstrated a sort of a lack of understanding of um, of the, the 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 psyche and the the political dynamics um, and this relationship, this unique and very tense relationship with European project. Um, and likewise, I think that, you know, this kind of, well, A, the sort of, I was appalled, I have to say, in the run-up to the referendum, at the lack of consideration of Northern Ireland. I just couldn't believe how little it featured in the debate. 
uh, overall. It was a very sort of, um, I, I would say, England focused debate. Mm -hmm. And to, obviously, to some extent, Scotland, but there was very little about Northern Ireland. And I remember uh, speaking to um, a political uh, correspondent in the Financial Times based in London and saying, why are you not covering? You know, I, I, I found it difficult to understand. Um, and I think that there just was very little understanding. So the idea in in um, the sort of public discourse in the UK that, that there was some chance that Ireland would, would follow suit if the UK voted to leave, I think was just totally detached from reality. It, it, it could not have been further from the truth. And that remains the case today. Yeah, which is what I had always assumed. And it was quite stunning to me that a unionist um, which is one of the people I was talking to, seemed to think that it was possible that Ireland would leave. Again, sort of suggesting that I, from the North or from England, there's a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. I think also, um, and I'm hoping David Liddington is going to contribute later, that I certainly remember talking to one of David's colleagues during the referendum who just assumed that we were going to remain and we'd win big. And so even within the UK, I think there was a degree of complacency among Remainers of not understanding the nature of the electorate. But obviously one of the places in the United Kingdom that voted to remain, obviously Northern Ireland did, but so did Scotland. And for the SNP, Ireland is very often used as an example, along with Denmark, of how it would be possible for Scotland to be independent in Europe and that the Irish success story could be a model. To what extent do you think you would want to send positive vibes to Scotland to say, yes, you, you too could be a successful small state in Europe or in the European Union? I, I, I know this is this is fraught with danger of being asked any question about, <laughs> about Scotland. And actually, I got into a lot of trouble previously and was this, uh, anyway, I was, I ended up being caught up in a, a flurry of complaints to the BBC about um, how an interview I did with the BBC was interpreted um, when I was Minister of State. I, I would say I was not responsible, but uh, uh, it, it certainly opened my eyes to just how divisive and tense this, this particular debate can be uh, in Scotland and indeed in the UK generally. Um, but um, well, look, I mean, I certainly think Brexit in it, Brexit has has changed things, um, um, and that can be interpreted either way, I guess. So, um, obviously, uh, the European Union, when this question arose before, was very very cautious, and there are very significant internal dynamics within uh, within the EU, um, mainly because of Spain, but but other countries as well who have you know, um, partitionist movements and um, who certainly don't want to give them any oxygen or fuel and, and Scotland would, would definitely be viewed through that lens um, by certain member states. So um, it's, it, it's, not, it's never a straightforward question and never would be a straightforward question. Um, I think from a, an EU perspective, it was much more difficult when the UK was a member state. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, now that um, the UK has left the European Union, I suppose any decision by 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 the people of Scotland ultimately would be would be would be looked on slightly differently um, and, uh, and and possibly slightly more favourably. Um, but you know, as I said, the EU is not homogenous on this by any means. Um, on the sort of the the, the countervailing view. Um, I mean, we can see the challenges around the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, <laughs> and they are significant. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we were told when this deal was struck, well, you know, this will be fine, there'll be no checks in the IRC, there'll be nothing to worry about, it'll all sort of just get resolved. And we were kind of told that by, by all sides, really. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, the reality was never going to be that straightforward. Um, you, you know, you can't have um, a territory uh, which is... Uh, part of the single market, but part of a different customs union, and not expect that there would be significant uh, challenges around that, particularly when uh, the UK government was very clear, in fairness, um, all along, or certainly certainly since um, the incumbent prime minister took over, um, that there was never going to be, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a move to aligning regulations with the European single market in any circumstances. So it's very, very complex. And 
obviously all of those issues would uh, arrive, arise for Scotland um, in the eventuality of a vote for independence as well. So that's not to say it's not resolvable, and um, there are huge benefits. And I think that's where the SNP and others would point to Ireland, you know, um, the way in which Ireland has thrived economically within the European Union um, is undoubtedly um, a model that a country like Scotland can point to. Um, but, you know, I just wouldn't underplay the significant challenges around, you know, effectively the, 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 the rupture or separation from um, uh, the rest of, of the United Kingdom. But um, that is definitely a political discussion that I'm not <laughs> going to make <laughs> because it's a minefield. <laughs> Understood. Well, taking you to another minefield, you've already said that the Irish protocol is a problem. To what extent do you think the current situation is likely to lead to moves to the reunification of Ireland. And I know we talked a bit about this before yeah. we went um, live, so you might feel you're rehearsing the same thing, but. No, no, not at all. So, I mean, uh, I mean, the, the starting point for all of this is that Brexit, you know, irrespective of what happens now in six months or in two years time, Brexit has enormously uh, damaged uh, the sort of the, the the peace process, political stability in Northern Ireland, um, and the sort of uh, settled. I mean, by no means was it perfect, and there were huge problems even within um, within uh, about the Good Friday Agreement. Um, but uh, those weaknesses um, have really come to light in the last few years. Um, and we've seen that, we saw that when the Northern Ireland executive uh, was on ice um, for unrelated reasons. But I mean, the reason that there was no incentive for the Northern Ireland um, executive to come to come back to the table or to the two main parties to come back to the table was undoubtedly Brexit. Um, and, you know, I think there was a certain amount of denial on both sides. So, you know, here in the in the south in the republic of ireland i think people have been guilty of really just ignoring uh, the unionist position and not really trying to understand it and that's not to say i endorse it or i think that you know uh, the dup has behaved impeccably certainly not but but to to fail to understand the basis of the unionist perspective in northern ireland which is that they are unionists they want to remain part of the united kingdom and um, and to fail to understand the vulnerability of that community in Northern Ireland, um, I think uh, showed an immaturity in politics in the South, as well as the extraordinary immaturity we have seen in Northern Ireland itself over the last few years. Um, and, you know, I mean, un unfortunately, I think, uh, ultimately, you know, the DUP had particular assurances, don't think they played it very well, don't think they served the unionist community of Northern Ireland particularly well, but ultimately they were thrown under the bus um, in order to, to arrive at this agreement for Northern Ireland Protocol. And I think it's an imperfect solution. It's a better solution than no solution, um, but it is clearly imperfect. And uh, you know that those challenges are very apparent now as you look at the disruption to trade and um, you know the, the huge, huge challenges that are being faced by Northern Ireland business. It was great to see that Lord Frost um, uh, has been engaging in the last 48 hours, um, I think in a meaningful way with Northern Ireland business um, and, you know, is is sort of um, taking the issue very seriously along with the Northern Ireland Secretary, Simon Coveney, the Foreign Minister here, and Micheál Martin, who has a particular, I would say, um, uh, sort of natural concern and um, particular interest in Northern Ireland um, and has set up a special unit in the Department of the Taoiseach here at the Prime Minister's office. You know, they, 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 there has been a consistent interest and effort in, in relation to Northern Ireland to try to address these issues. Um, but at the moment, I mean, there is just a, a quite a logjam um, and, and it's hard to see exactly how it's going to be resolved. Um, I could criticise the British government all day in terms of how, but, well, you know, just in, in recent months, how it was handled when Michael Gove, who had been really engaging constructively with both with the EU in the form of Maris Tetkovic and with Simon Coveney, the Irish government, when he was sort of moved aside and Lord Frost was uh, put in place to, to, to take over the Northern Ireland um, responsibility, 
or the protocol responsibilities, Brexit responsibilities. Um, you know, there was there was a certain um, I think game playing that went on that was really unhelpful. Um, it definitely accelerated the uh, or exacerbated the um, the violence that we were witnessing in Derry and Belfast. It really didn't help matters. Um, that has quietened down now, and uh, you know, in fairness, I would say Lord Frost does seem to be engaging constructively now with Marsepkovic um, and with the European Commission, and there is some hope of progress. I don't think there'll be a breakthrough, but there, there's certainly hope of progress uh, by June, and uh, you know, if nothing else, I think that would get us through the summer and the marching season and all of the very, very tense political period that lies ahead. That's a very long answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Barry, am I allowed one more question or do you want to go to the audience? Absolutely, one more, Julie, no problem. Thank you. So you said at the outset, Lucinda, that in some ways Ireland is somewhat vulnerable in the face of Brexit. To what extent though, is there an opportunity? Because obviously Ireland, despite having Gaelic as a, as a language, has English as a major language. So to what extent is there an opportunity for Ireland to be a beneficiary from Brexit? So uh, I think it's enormous. Um, you know, it really is up to up to us uh, in terms of how we position ourselves. Um, so the, so the, 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 the challenges and risks are kind of, as I outlined, small member state, you know, um, the risk that uh, agendas from the larger member states kind of uh, overtake uh, events at, at European level and particularly um, the central, the large central uh, Europe, European countries can be quite protectionist, um, you know, um, quite um, illiberal uh, when it comes to trade and, um, and sort of economics, uh, fiscal policy, etc. Um, but there are, you know, there are, there is a block of, um, of member states who feel very differently. And I think it's really about playing our, our cards quite, quite cleverly, you know, um, and actually setting out to, to shape the agenda by being nimble. Um, and I think, for, you know, for any small country, you have to be nimble um, by being willing, willing to compromise. Um, so you can't always expect to get everything your own way. And, I think we have to really sit back as a country and 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 figure out exactly how we want to go about that. So, um, you know, before we joined the European communities in, in 1972, Gareth Fitzgerald, who uh, former Taoiseach and uh, at that time uh, foreign minister, um, uh, published a white paper, which, you know, sort of set out Ireland's position as to, you know, where we saw ourselves in the European project and how we wanted to leverage it and and uh, ensure that our membership was beneficial for Ireland. And that was appropriate at the time for a much smaller European community. We now you know, have the 27 member states, it's much larger. And um, I think the financial crisis really took the wind out of Ireland's sails. So I remember when I became Minister for European Affairs, you know, colleagues from Slovakia, from Czech Republic, from uh, Central and Eastern European countries would come to me and say, you know, your uh, former prime minister is, you know, uh, visited our, our country when no other European leaders came or sent uh, civil servants to help train us, to educate us on how to draw down EU funds, et cetera, et cetera. And we really invested quite a bit. It was ad hoc, but 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 in fairness, I think Bertie O'Hearn, our, our, our former Taoiseach, um, really understood the importance of that. But when the crash came, we withdrew all of that and, and the funding and resources became, you know, less, it was less available. Um, so I think we really need to start building that up again, building our bilateral relationships with other member states, building goodwill, political capital. Um, and, you know, during the financial crisis, I felt that the strategy in Dublin was to focus almost exclusively on Berlin and Paris because they were the big member states. And that is important. And those relationships and Simon Coveney actually uh, in the last year initiated a review of our strategic bilateral relationship with Berlin, which is excellent. We need more of that. But we also need to be looking at our relationship with the Baltic states, with the Nordics, um, you know, with, 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 with the, the, the broad range of EU member states of small, medium and large size and scale and figuring out what are our priorities, where can we build alliances with the French, it's traditionally been on agriculture. So we contradict ourselves entirely by saying, we, you know, we're, we were with our British friends on tax and trade, but then suddenly we we're on the opposite side of the fence 
on agriculture. And for a small country, maybe we have to continue to be like that. We have to build alliances on specific themes with different, different countries. But I think we really need to step back, assess and evaluate, and then really set about it. We haven't really ramped up our presence in Brussels. Our, our uh, permanent representation is no larger really than it was pre-Brexit, maybe a few extra people, but um, you know, when you consider just one example, financial services, hugely important to the Irish economy. Um, most of the public consultations um, and the work that goes into lobbying on, on, on uh, financial services regulation was done by the UK. Uh, we supported it, but we didn't have the capacity or the manpower. We still don't, and we need to bolster that. Um, so there's there's a huge amount to do. Uh, and final point is uh, Th uh, Thomas Byrne, our current EU Affairs Minister, has relaunched the EU jobs campaign that I launched. Um, and I have to say, I copied David Liddington when I did this because he was going around visiting all these UK universities. And I said, Ooh, that's a good idea. Um, <laughs> so I launched a campaign in our universities and third level institutions. And I personally went and visited every single one of them and tried to, and we put in place language training supports in our foreign ministries where people doing the Concor. Um, and it was it, 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 it was it was relatively successful, but you know, mm -hmm. uphill battle for for us Anglo 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 Saxon countries. Um, but Thomas Byrne, our EU Affairs Minister, last week week launched a really good uh, campaign to recruit the, the EU institutions, and most importantly, and I could never convince my colleague in the finance ministry to do this, he has secured funding to send the content national experts to the EU institutions. That is worth its weight in gold in terms of influence, in terms of connections. And I'm just delighted to see it because it's something that I lobbied internally in our government for, but in 2011, 12, we had no money, so we couldn't do it. So it's just brilliant to see it happening now. Thank you. That was such a positive note on which to hand back to Barry for wider um, conversations, but thank you so much. Thank you very much, Julie. Also, thanks both to both speakers and to all the participants for the questions. So these are also my two great interests in research and, and politics, Ireland and the EU. So I could listen to you both talking all day. Um, but I've been busy grouping questions under four headings there. I'm sure, Lucinda, that will come as no great surprise to you. The first one I'm going to talk to you about is about tax. Then I'll move on to a question or two about common foreign and security policy. We'll have a section on Northern Ireland, and then we'll conclude on the future of the EU. There'll be a closing question or two if we have time, but I'd say it's doubtful. I address Jerry Malumbi because I can see that your, your video is on there. I didn't quite get your question, Jerry. If you could re-put it in the chat, that'd be great. Um, as always, listen, if it looks like I'm not paying attention, it's just because I'm flitting back and forth between the questions and answers whilst you're speaking. So the first one comes from David Liddington. And actually on this question of tax, I'll put two together. David asks, how do you think Ireland will respond to the growing pressure, both from within the EU and from President Biden uh, for EU or even global minimum levels of corporation tax? You touched on this in your intervention, but perhaps you could expand on it for David. Relatedly, Declan Keane asks, was EU support for Ireland during the Brexit negotiations provided in return for an Irish commitment to engage on EU international tax reform? So was there some kind of quiet quid pro quo there that you want to respond to? Thanks, Bill. Okay, uh, great question. Um, uh, so how will how will how is the Irish government responding to the moves on tax? I think uh, I I think it's fair to say um, the Irish government was taken aback by uh, by the sort of sudden and fairly dramatic intervention of the Biden administration. Um, I mean, you know, in a sense, what uh, what the U.S. Treasury is, has proposed is not a lot different to what we heard from both Trump and Obama in the past. I mean. This has been an aspiration of both the Republicans and the Democrats for a long time, but um, tax reform is uh, easy to talk about as um, our French colleagues have learned and a lot more difficult to actually uh, uh, achieve agreement on. Um, so uh, I think certainly the reaction in Dublin was one of, uh, you know, nearly, uh, I don't want to exaggerate, but maybe kind of rabbit in the headlights. Whoa, holy, holy moly, this is, 
you know, Joe Biden is our friend and his family are from Mayo and he references, you know, Irish Catholics in every second paragraph. And all of a sudden, you know, not only are they talking about a global minimum corporate tax rate, which obviously would impact Ireland, um, but also in the communication published by the US Treasury, Ireland, along with the Netherlands, was referred to as a tax haven, which is language that, you know, we, I, I say that collectively, who nearly the whole of Irish society, uh, rejects. Uh, we are not a tax haven. We are a, certainly a low tax, competitive tax environment, but we are not a tax haven. We don't meet any of the three criteria outlined by the OECD. So um, that was that was seen as a kind of a you know an unfair uh, uh, move. Um, but uh, but but generally speaking, yes, definitely concern here in Dublin. And um, the the initial um, and very swift response was the, the finance ministry here. Uh, held a global webinar on taxation and tax reform. Um, I don't recall them doing that before. Um, so I think that was the sign of concern. Um, and uh, and uh, Pascal Donoghue, uh, our finance minister, uh, led that. And uh, it was well attended. And, uh, you know, it was, I suppose, Ireland trying to present itself as, you know, engaged and, you know, not shirking its responsibility on this tax reform discussion. Um, at, I mean, at EU level, uh, for, for you could say the best part of two decades, we have um, consistently called for any moves on tax reform to be dealt with at OECD level and not at EU level. And I think we've been pretty successful in that. Um, you know, if you look at you know all of the moves around CCCTB, obviously we heavily relied on the UK um, as an ally, um, but also you know many of the, the countries which have now formed this Hanseatic League um, of um, sort of like-minded member states, the the Swedes, um, the 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 Dutch, the Baltics, etc. Um, and so Ireland has that has been the tactic. It's been to sort of shunt it off to the OECD, um, the Hansa League. Uh, uh, blocked uh, moves for digital tax at EU level, and that again has been kicked off the OECD. So, um, you know, the Irish government would say we play our part, we're fully engaged, we have, and in fairness, we have closed off a lot of tax loopholes in the last decade. Um, Michael Noonan um, was actually quite reforming. Um, you know, we had to by necessity, um, it wasn't out of the goodness of our hearts necessarily, but a lot did happen to close off, you know, the, the double Irish and some of these tax loopholes. and. Um, you know, we played our part in that through the BEPS process, through the OECD process. Um, so I think the hope will be that the Biden administration might rein in and, and focus its efforts um, on the OECD negotiations um, rather than sort of, you know, trying to uh, impose um, a, a US Treasury solution that there might be more sort of engagement and give and take. And I, I expect that that's what will happen. Um, of course, there'll be pushback from US cor corporate America um, and that'll be navigated by the Biden administration, but he certainly seems uh, determined to to, um, to to push ahead. So I think Ireland will be cautious, concerned, but definitely very engaged, and will try to be seen to be a, a good child, participating, but you know not conceding ground on you know reducing our corporate tax level. That is the holy grail for Ireland, as you know, the twelve and a half percent rate. We would argue. Our rate is our rate, it's transparent, and we, we stick to it unlike other, other countries that might have a 30% um, uh, headline rate, but their effective rate can be down to 2%, depending on sweetheart deals, et cetera. So we would claim that we're a lot, we're a lot more transparent than that. Um, and then on the question of a quid pro quo yep. um, uh, between uh, Ireland and the EU on the tax issue in exchange for Brexit, uh, Northern Ireland Brexit support, no. Uh, I would say no, there, there was no sweetheart deal. There was no sort of um, uh, agreement. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. Um, I think in fairness, um, uh, you know, Ireland, the government, um, uh, the European or the foreign affairs minister in particular, spent a lot of time engaging with colleagues in the member states um, through the council and an, an inordinate number of ministers from other member states, including France, Germany, et cetera, came here, came to the border, met with um, business groups and civil society groups, groups involved in the peace process. And I think the EU sees the peace process as a success um, that they have participated in. They have funded peace projects um, both sides of the border. You know, they see themselves as a kind of a, 
you know, nearly a custodian of the peace process in a sense. So I think there was a genuine concern. Michel Barnier had been, I think, minister uh, in the French government around the time of the Good Friday Agreement. So he was very familiar with it going back to that time. So he had a kind of an investment in it as well. So no, but of course, I mean, you know, you, the nature of geopolitics is if you, you know, if you, get, if you receive support, you are expected in, in due course to also support in return. And that's why I think not just on the on the question of Brexit in Northern Ireland, but generally speaking, Ireland can't be seen to be part of a bloc that says no to everything. You know, we have to be coming to the table with solutions on a whole range of issues. We have to be engaged. Um, and uh, uh, that's how I read it, as opposed to any sort of secret deal or, you know, any pressure directly exerted. I, I, that definitely was not and is not the case. I look forward to your book on the topic, Lucinda, because it ought to be written. I think this is a super interesting uh, topic that shouldn't be as interesting, corporate tax and Ireland's relationship to it. Moving swiftly on, because we're always against the, against the clock here, uh, there's a question from uh, our own Brendan Sims regarding foreign policy, let's call it. So this is just to be prefaced by the fact that it's always been a thorny subject, Ireland's relationship to neutrality. Um, broadly, what is the future, do you think, of Ireland's role within... Uh, CFSP, CSTP, the European foreign uh, foreign policy, will there be more or less of it? And specifically from Brendan, Brendan asks, would you give up neutrality for unification if it were the price of staying in the EU? Two fairly kind of complex questions, but related to the notion of Irish neutrality, Lucinda. Um, so uh, thanks, Brendan. So maybe just taking the last part first you know the question of unification is a romantic notion that if you ask any Irish person are you in favor of um, reunification of the island of Ireland they'll say yes but when it comes down to the brass tacks of the cost of unification and the practicalities and potential fallout um, for the peace process or the compromises that would need to be made to to genuinely have an inclusive island which in, which includes and respects the unionist community in Northern Ireland I think you'll find a lot of Irish people would not be quite so, you know, ready to to step up right at this point in time. So, I, you know, I think that we are a long way away from Irish reunification, and uh, I think that actually Brexit, in a way, has made it more complicated because tensions have been, become so heightened in Northern Ireland. Um, that's the sorry, is a slightly. I know it was kind of linked, but it, it but I just. I, you know, I think we have a long way to go before we're seriously discussing unification in this country um, or before there would be a, a majority uh, in favour of it um, in practicality as opposed to the romantic notion. Um, um, on neutrality, um, well, that's also a bit of a romantic notion because, of course, Ireland isn't really neutral. Um, we are just barely unaligned and we're not really unaligned, let's be honest. You know, we we have um, uh, we have. US Army stop offs in Shannon Airport, um, Ireland rightly, and I would 100% um, endorse uh, the role we took, but Ireland uh, actively engaged in the Balkans conflict, uh, even when there were, uh, there was no sort of um, triple lock endorsement of our involvement. Um, so I think the notion of Irish neutrality is a little bit dishonest. I don't believe we okay. We're not members of NATO, um, but uh, you know we certainly benefit from the security that NATO provides to this part of the world. Um, we're happy to receive, and we're a lot we're a lot less happy to 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 give. Um, so that is not. Uh, I'm not speaking for the Irish people. I'm giving you my my frank assessment. Um, so uh, Ireland has over the last uh, twenty years. You know, increasingly become involved in uh, European um, uh, security and defence policy. We are part of, you know, various battle groups. We deploy uh, Irish troops as part of EU-led missions, um, and I'm personally very proud of that. Um, it is the primary role now, really, of the defence forces through both the UN and EU missions. It's kind of what they do. Um, there's, there's not, you know. There's not a, a, a an immediate um, sort of security or defence risk um, in Ireland at present. Although you know, I think we're all watching what's happening in Northern Ireland very closely. Um, but um, you know, so I I don't I I think that's going to continue. You know, I think Ireland will continue to participate um, in European security and defence policy, common foreign security policy. 
Um, and I, I hope that we can have an honest and mature uh, national discussion about it because I don't believe we have to date. Um, and I think it's a positive thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, that's, that's where I stand on that, on that particular matter. A simple follow-up, Lucinda, in terms of the UK's departure, do you think that is likely to, to catalyse more or less Irish involvement in foreign and security policy, or do you think these two things are unrelated? No, I think, I think they are to some extent, because I said at the outset, you know, part of Ireland's sort of re-evaluating its role in the European uh, project will have to be about give and take and, you know, uh, contributing more uh, in certain areas. You know, if you want to fend off sort of moves on um, on tax, for example, or if you want to, you know, uh, have a have a voice on, you know, on uh, trade issues in the future and on regulation, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, tech regulation or, you know, issues that are of sort of strategic national interest, then you have to be prepared to cooperate and give on other issues. And, uh, and I see European security and defence policy as being one of those issues. Um, you know, it makes sense. And uh, yeah, you see the French and others really, really trying to drive um, uh, um, change in this area and to deepen and strengthen European security. Uh, and you can see why, because there's, you know, obviously after four years of the Trump administration, there's a, uh, there's certainly diminished uh, trust in the in the transatlantic alliance and diminished trust in the ability of Europe to to sort of depend on the United States and that mm -hmm. has obviously uh, that has implications for the debate debate within Europe um, what I really want to see as well in tandem with that is is you know continued and deeper and closer cooperation between the UK and and the EU in this area and I think that will happen um, but of course it's uh, it's uh, it can be controversial absolutely thank you Lucinda and also you you described Ireland as being just barely unaligned. That could be a good title for your book, by the way. <laughs> um, moving on to the, the third group of questions, uh, and it's obviously, it's kind of one of the loftier ones, one of, one of the bigger ones, I mean, and it pertains to Northern Ireland and, and what's going on at the moment. Um, and it was a, actually David Lindenson's question, his second question kind of captures much of what's been said. So I'm going to read it at a small bit of length. So David asks, how concerned are you um, and opinion in Ireland more generally about the continuing friction over the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. How serious do you think the risk is of the Commission and EU government not agreeing a compromise? And what would Ireland's likely position be if, for example, the UK government simply extended the current unilateral derogations further, even, indef even indefinitely? It's a rather multifaceted question, so if you want to take a second to think about it, Lucinda, please do. Uh, well, on the question of concern, um, I'm well. I'm I'm deeply concerned uh, in terms of uh, what we have seen um, in Northern Ireland over the last number of months. Um, the violence in the streets, as I mentioned earlier, in Beth, Belfast and Derry, I think were foreseeable. Um, you know, I think that the debate was skewed here because everybody was concerned about the potential for paramilitary Republican violence um, uh, in the aftermath of Brexit. And there was very little concern or attention given to the risk of um, loyalist violence. And again, I think it was, it should have been very obvious and very foreseeable. And that is by no means endorsing it. Obviously, this is just, um, I think this was always going to be an inevitable consequence of, um, of, uh, of the, protracted negotiations to the EU and the UK and this solution while it it um, you know it, it solved the problem uh, both for the EU and for the Johnson government in, in that it got us to a point where we could put in place the uh, the trade cooperation agreement um, you know it, it it hasn't it hasn't in any way resolved the the issues for Northern Ireland um, and I know people will say, well, you know, Northern Ireland can have the best of both worlds, et cetera. Um, but that's, I think that's very, that's only if you view it through an economic lens and not through the political and societal aspects, which of course are the big issue in Northern Ireland. Mm. Um, so um, so I'm, I'm very concerned about it. Um, the, 
like I, obviously I'm talking to um, my contacts in the commission and into the, in the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs as well on a regular basis on, on all of this and the ongoing work on the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I think there was really, really deep concern uh, two months ago, really serious concern. Um, I think there is a, a more positive perspective at the moment because there is a sense that um, a lot of progress has been made on the technical issues. So I think there are probably eight or nine technical issues that have to be worked out between the EU and the UK side, and there is progress on those. And then there's the big political issues which require political compromise. And the political compromise reached um, before Brexit actually happened, um, or before the end of the um, of the uh, transition phase, uh, was only ever a kind of a sticking plaster solution. It wasn't actually a, a, a lasting solution, and that's what we're experiencing now is trying to get to a point where there can be agreement. What is necessary is, uh, is clearly is, especially for the movement of, of, um, of goods, agriculture, goods, food um, in particular, which is really a really big problem in the North at the moment, as you know, um, is a veterinary agreement. Um, both sides want one, um, but, but you know, getting to a political compromise around um, you know, some sort of a hybrid between uh, regulatory convergence and um, and some sort of equivalence, um, I think will take many, many more months. Um, it's pretty existential for the British government, but um, it is also existential for the for the EU and understandably so. Um, and this is a big concern for the Irish government because if agreement isn't reached on this, there is a real risk that um, Northern Ireland becomes leaky and uh, that could start entering the Irish market and thereby the European single market and that are not up to EU regulatory standards. And then there's a real risk from the Irish perspective that other European countries actually shut their borders to Irish goods. Um, so um, this is a real risk. And um, um, while there's been forbearance from the French and others, um, especially as the violence is flaring in Northern Ireland in the last few months, I think in, you know, in six months or 12 months time, this is gonna have to be resolved. And I don't know what the, res what the resolution will be um i don't certainly don't think it'll happen by june but i think if we can keep the the sort of the politics de-dramatized to steal that phrase was that during the trees of may i can't remember when the de dramatization happened but it sounds like um, if we can keep that de-dramatization going for another few months um and uh, and and try to find a solution for the end of the year and if not yes i i think that there will have to be an, a, a continued agreed unilateral extension <laughs> if if that's not too paradoxical um but uh you know at some point um you know forbearance will just run out at, at eu level so there will have to be political agreement and if there's not then we we face real disruption and real problems in northern ireland i don't think we'll get to that somehow somehow i feel that both the johnson government and the european commission are pragmatic enough and we've seen this a thousand times at eu level you know, there's always a solution that can be found if the will is there. And I think the will ultimately will be there. It may not be there right now, but in six months time or 12 months time, I think it will. We're going to wrap up in a few minutes, but I should just say that my, my colleague, Professor Eugenio Biagini, who is the co-organizer of this event, who I should have said at the very outset, would have closed and said thank you, but he's t just told me he has to leave, unfortunately. So for the purpose of the room, I just want to send everybody Eugenio's regards. He's waving there. Um, but Lucinda, just to stay focused for the few minutes that we have, um, you're out of frontline politics for now. So mm -hmm. you can be a bit more forthright, but still I invite you to sidestep this question if you want. Um, now isn't the 1990s. Do you think that the political leadership exists that you kind of refer to to find a proactive compromise to the big political issues that you mentioned? Or do you think um, it's kind of lacking when looking back to the kind of the Humes and the Blairs and the Yehoans back in the 1990s? Uh, it's not, it's certainly not, it's certainly not in any way comparable. I mean, mm -hmm. so I'd be very blunt about that. I mean, mm -hmm. there is no leadership in Northern Ireland. It's catastrophic. Um, and uh, do I see um, Boris Johnson having the same uh, concern, interest, agenda, to resolve these issues in Northern Ireland? No, I don't. Um, that doesn't mean I'm a big cheerleader for Tony Blair, but I mean, objectively speaking, you know, there, there's no comparison. I mean, um, we, we have seen a, a fairly flagrant disregard for Northern Ireland um, 
in the last number of years and uh, it's disappointing but i i think that's the case um but you know you can't underestimate the value of pragmatic politics to to force solutions to be found i mean this isn't a complex negotiation of the of the same level as the Bel belfast or northern or the good friday agreement because you know that was literally getting terrorist organizations to put down their guns and there happened to be a kind of a con confluence of events and leaders hume trimble bertie etc who you know were just the right people at the right time and clinton like let's not forget um you know the the, the huge particular interest of northern ireland or of the u.s administration at that time um, and it just all worked you know this is not as complex as that in a sense I mean, this is about finding a political solution that is in the interest of uh, the selfish interest of both sides it's in the selfish interest of london to make sure that there isn't going to be a complete eruption of violence in northern ireland i mean to me that's fairly self-evident um and there's an interest in the eu in the same thing um mm -hmm. there's an interest obviously in the uk in trying to and the british government in trying to uh ensure that they don't sort of concede too much on regulatory alignment but at the same time does it really matter does it it is, is it really fundamental do you know there might be a negative headline in the telegraph for for a day but like really beyond that will anybody judge boris johnson on that i don't think so but they will judge him if bombs start going off in 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 uh canary wharf you know um so let's you know i suppose look at it from a kind of a selfish interest pr perspective as opposed to these great statesmen and statescraft i don't think that's what's required here to be honest mm -hmm. i think a deal can be done and uh if if not for magnanimous reasons then just for purely selfish political pragmatic reasons mm -hmm. that that's good enough that'll do but i do worry about northern ireland in the medium term and long term i mean you know it is dysfunctional mm -hmm. the politics in northern ireland um you know this artificial i mean it's a bit like the Dayton agreement, like, you know, you, you put in place an agreement to solve a particular problem at a time, but 20 or 22 years later, is it fit for purpose? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got these two are totally opposing political parties who dominate everything in Northern Ireland and carve up positions and, uh, you know, are doing a pretty woeful job of it, to be honest. Um, and uh, that's very disappointing. And I think the people of Northern Ireland deserve better, but how do how do they achieve it? You know, and this is the polarized politics that they've got. And you know, there is no alternative at present. So that's a much more difficult question. And uh, and it's further down the line. And at the moment we have to see who becomes the leader of the DUP and what happens there. And the but, UUP now also. And the UUP is easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I could, as always, this in like a talk to talk to you about this. I could also, of course, have mentioned Trimble or Mallon or Major or Reynolds or any of the great figures in the nineties. Wasn't betraying any of my own biases there, but um, no, ab no, absolutely. But the guys yeah. who had the pens, I suppose, and were there on the, you know, yeah, yeah. exactly. The, the signatures. Yeah. Yeah. There's a ton of other questions which I'm going to share with you by email, Lucinda, because we're out of time. There was questions about just pertaining to the EU's COVID response, about the prospect of. Uh, the, the UK ever returning to the EU and how that would go down. Uh, that was from, from uh, Jerry Malumby and various other questions about Ireland being a small state in a big world. So maybe we'll save that for the next chapter at some time in the future. Uh, the only thing I would say is um, I, for one, in the morning, next week, next year, 10 years time, will welcome the UK back as a member of the European Union. I think it is a tragedy of the highest order what has happened. And uh, I think most people, certainly Irish people, would share that view. And you think the 21 other small states that are left in the EU would share that view, listen, do you reckon? I think I think many of them would. I can think of one in particular who might not, but the UK overcame that in 1972, and I'm sure it can, can do it again. <laughs> For another day again. Lucinda, thank you so much. And also to Julie, obviously, and to all of those in attendance. Um, the recording of this event will be available on our website, uh, which is currently under construction. Watch this space. But also, as I've said previously, our next meeting is on the 1st of June, where we're thrilled to have and Naomi Long, who is the current Justice Minister in the Northern Ireland Executive, subject to Assembly Business, will be speaking with us. And then I think another really interesting event will be on the 13th of July with Ian Marshall. So Ian Marshall, as many of you will know, was until recently the only unionist uh, representative in the House of the Oireachtas. Uh, he was a, a recent senator, former president of the Ulster Farmers Association. So he's a very interesting perspective in the future of the island. So these, these are the next two events. The next months we have a really kind of star-studded range of speakers with the aforementioned Bertie Hearn, John Bruton, Claire Hanna MP, 
Jeffrey Donaldson, Julian Smith, former Northern Ireland Secretary, uh, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, I should say, Eileen Weir from the Shankill uh, Women's Centre, and of course, our own David Lillington and others. So it's obviously a moment where people are happy to speak about Ireland. We're thrilled to have access to people like Lucinda. We very much hope that we can be together again, perhaps in, in person next time to tease out these issues in the long term. So thank you all for your attention. Lucinda and Judy, again, thanks a lot for your time. And have a good afternoon. Cheers. Thanks, Lucinda. Thanks, Thank Barry. You. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.